sea el nombre de nuestro Dios. God is good. Well, not so fast. Well, hold on a second. <laughs> we get so used to sometimes just responding that we don't take time to really think about what we're responding to. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but my prayers don't go no higher than the ceiling. Sometimes, I'm not quite sure if God is even there. So, I want you to wrestle with me this morning, both with our hearts and our minds and our wallets. So, I want to begin by making us a little uncomfortable and I do want you to take out your wallets or open your purse and well, really, go ahead, do it, I'm not kidding. <laughs> and pull out a daughter bill, okay? And if thou brother or sister does not have a daughter bill and thy have two, give to thy brother or sister yes. one of thy, brother, thy daughter bill. All right. And when you get your daughter bill, I want you to rave it. I want to make sure everybody has one Good. And the next thing I want to do to make you just a little uncomfortable is being that I'm a good old Southern Baptist preacher, I am going to do an altar call at the end of the service. I don't know why you're laughing. I'm really, I'm serious. I'm going to do an altar call at the end of the service. So hold on to that. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, that if you ask, you shall receive. If you seek, you will find. And if you knock, it shall be open unto you. And yet, 30,000 children died today of hunger and preventable diseases. And 30,000 children will die tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. It is as though they are asking but are not receiving. They are seeking but not finding. They are knocking upon our doors, and it is not being opened. It is as if they are praying for bread and instead are being given a stone. They are asking for fish and receiving instead a snake. So I have to try to reconcile what my Lord and Savior said on one hand and the reality in the other. Now most of us who believe Say we have a God, but I would argue that sometimes that is a lesser God because this is the God we worship. And even for those who are not theistic, I would argue probably worship the same God that we do. I know liberals, bless their hearts, would tell us that we are the hands of God and therefore it is up to us to provide for those who have not. But even if we do, 30,000 children are still dying and I have to ask, where is God in the midst of this tragedy? This symbol signifies our power in the world. In Indonesia, a day's work gets you two of these. In Bangladesh, it gets you half of one of these. In the US, a woman only makes 70% of one of these. Black women, 60%, Latinas about 50-55%. This 
signifies so much power that Jesus spoke more about money than any other topic in the Gospels. Jesus knew where our hearts were and therefore spoke more about money than salvation, heaven, God, the Spirit, or anything else. So if we truly want to be faithful to the gospel, we too need to reckon with this God within our midst. I confess you to you this morning that I am hopeless. When I see the misery of the wretched of the earth, when I see how so many people unneededly die, I am hopeless standing in the vastness of neoliberalism. And I could do several things with my hopelessness. I could give up. I could say, why bother? I just thank God I have my piece of the pie so I could just tune out and turn on the TV. Or I could become a cynic. Either of those two choices reveals my class privilege. And I'm not going to name on that. <laughs> it reveals my class privilege because I have the privilege of not having to deal with the wretchedness of the earth. That's right. For those who are dispossessed, disenfranchised, disinherited, they have no choice but to fight for survival and continue to try to change the world to bring about justice. Yes. And here's the question that I have to ask you. Do you fight for justice because you think you're going to win? Or do you fight for justice knowing you're going to lose? Because you are going to lose. Neoliberalism has won. Global capitalism will be part of our lives for a couple of generations. We, our children, and our grandchildren will live in an unjust world. So come to the realization that if you're going to fight for justice, it's not because you're going to win. So what do I do when it is hopeless, when I know I'm not going to win, and I just cannot turn my back upon the world? Being a good Baptist, I have three points to my sermon, <laughs> which I will now do. The first point is that we have to screw with the systems. Now, in, in the book I wrote, I use more colorful language. <laughs> but I'm cognizant as to where I am today. <laughs> One of the ways structures of oppression is maintained is by those who have the power to make the rules for everyone else to follow. So if I want to go against these structures, I have to break the rules. Why is it that I have to go to the police department to get a permit from the police department so I can picket the police department for its police brutality. 
You see, a space is created for us where we can go and feel good about ourselves by protesting against injustices, but at the end of that day, because those who created the space did so, so that we could feel good about ourselves and nothing changes. I always love it when some of my dear liberal friends come to me and say, come, let's go get arrested. <laughs> so that we could get our street cred. And I tell them, I'm a Latino, I don't have to try to get arrested. <laughs> you guys go ahead. <laughs> so the issue is not to protest and get arrested to get my street cred, the issue is how do I really screw with the system so as to raise consciousness so as to bring a new way of seeing? And let me give you an example. In, in New York, where I grew up, there was a gang known as the Young Lords back in the late 60s. And they went ahead and went to a local church and said, we like to come here and set up a food, a food bank and provide um, childcare and, and, and provide breakfast for children um, and, and do all this great stuff. And the pastor looked at them and said, ah, oh, you're a bunch of commies, get out of here. So they came back the next Sunday, they picked up the pastor, threw him out, and they took over the, ch the church and they nailed on the door the church of the people, la iglesia de la gente. And you know what? The people, for the first time, started coming to that church. <laughs> they started filling up the church. And for the first time, the church began to live up to its own rhetoric. Right. So when I say screw the systems, I'm talking about forcing the structures to live up to the rhetoric they profess that they believe in. Right. They also went ahead and got, you know, the, 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 the barrio was a very filthy place. So they, they cleaned the streets, they put all the garbage in bags, they put them on the corner. They called the sanitation department and said, we've done this, please come get the garbage. And of course, the sanitation department came around whenever they felt like it. So they just laughed and hung up. So they took those same garbage bags, they went to Third Avenue, they built an eight foot wall and they set it on fire. Of course, they all got arrested. Of course, it made front page of the news. And you know what, since then, the sanitation department has been going ahead and picking up the garbage twice a week. Because what we discover is that those with power and privilege never go to the oppress and say, you know, we got too much power here. We need to share a little bit. <laughs> Let me give you some so we could be more just. You have to screw with the systems to create an environment where consciousness raising can occur and people could see a new vision and with a new vision, turn the world upside down. Point number two, solidarity. Anselm, great theologian of about a thousand years ago, he's dead now. Um, <laughs> gave us the theology that Jesus Christ died for our sins. In other words, God was so angry with us that the only way God could be pleased was to kill his son or her son so that I don't have to die a horrible death. I don't know about you, but I have a little bit of a problem with that theology. It makes God somewhat sadistic and highly, va highly vain that the only way God can be pleased was by the shedding of other people's blood. And I'm the first to say I'm a sinner. But I don't, I'm not sure if 
I've done that many bad things that I deserve to be tortured to death. So maybe the crucifixion has more to do with solidarity. Jesus dies on the cross in solidarity with all the oppressed who are dying on the crosses that are erected by the government and by the church. And maybe salvation, which is also a bad translation, the better word to use is liberation. Maybe the liberation I find in Christ is knowing that as the ultimate act of solidarity, Christ dies willingly with the oppressed and the wretched of the earth. There is nothing redemptive about suffering. Redemption comes through the act of solidarity. Hence, point three, we're told to pick up our cross and follow Christ. It's kind of like saying, sit in the electric chair and join me. And we can't lose what's being said here. It is an act of willingly suffering. That is crucifying all that causes oppression. Dying with the oppressed on the crosses of racism and classism and homophobia and sexism and every other ism you could imagine. My theology of the cross was highly influenced by an early 20th century Buddhist philosopher named Nishida. And what Nishida, who is not a Christian, but with the eyes of an outsider showed great wisdom, teaches me, is that on the cross, God becomes nothing emptying God's self of all divinity and power and privilege and everything. And my own liberation is when I stand before the nothingness of God on a cross and I also become nothing that I also nail upon that cross my own sins. Not the personal piety stuff, but my own sins of racism, my own sins of sexism, my own sins of homophobia, my own sins of classism. And only then can I become a new creature. And only then Can I stand in solidarity with everyone else who is being crucified today and work towards the goal of justice, knowing that I may never get there, knowing that it may never be realized in my lifetime, but also knowing that I am planting those seeds that may bear fruit eight generations from now. Now for the altar call. The daughter bell. I want you to make a decision today. I want you to decide if you're willing to crucify yourself for the glory and the honor of being in solidarity 
with the oppressed of the world. And here's the symbol that I want you to do. If this signifies the false idols of my world, when the basket comes around, I want you to do one of two things. And this is up to you. No one's watching. This is really up to you. You can either say, I'm not willing to pay the price. Thank you very much. Nice sermon preacher, but you know. And put the money back in your pocket, go on your merry way, no problem. But if you really, really are interested in this thing called solidarity and justice, then as an outward expression of an inward conversion, place the daughter in the basket along with your tithes and offerings. This is not your tithes and offerings. <laughs> along with your tithes and offerings. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, if people are willing to stand in solidarity with the wretched of the earth, maybe I can begin to hope against all hope. Thank you.